Hello, hello, my wonderful audience. The man you're looking at is amazing, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to remind all of you how much it means to me to know that you're out there, that once a week I get to talk with all of you, and then I get to watch these short videos, and that some of you are really regular followers of uh, the uh, Dr. Peter Bregan channel. It's just a wonderful thing. And as always, I want to thank PRN, uh, .fm, uh, Gary Knoll Station for uh, putting me on the radio, on the internet radio, and then um, being just happy to allow me to expand to the YouTube channel. Uh, we're every Wednesdays at 4 p.m. I haven't mentioned that in a while on the radio. And then uh, within a day or so after that, we go up on YouTube. And uh, I'm just so glad to have you as a stabilizing uh, place in my life. Uh, one stabilize, the big stabilizing place, of course, is family. But this extended family with all of you as uh, Christmas passes and we're going to be past January when this goes on the air. Matters to me a lot, as well as my practice. Um, it's my clinical practice. I'm so glad to be connected to the world. Um, Denis Rancourt, R-A-N-C-O-U-R-T. He and I have been having the most astonishing conversation before getting started. We've never met before. I actually read one of his papers for the first time today. Uh, Ginger has always found him on the Twitter, I guess. Uh, I don't look at Twitter. Ginger does and manages hers and mine. And uh, said, this is an amazing man. And um, <clears throat> I read his paper and looked before the session today, and it's brilliant. Um, uh, Denis is doing a lot of what I'm doing in a sense, and this is what we're going to focus on a lot today, in the sense of being a scientist. He is a retired professor of physics from the University of Ottawa, and he also uh, belongs to the Ontario Civil Liberties Association. Um, and he's writing papers looking at the scientific basis for one after another of the COVID-19 policies and practices. And they don't really have, as you all know, much of a scientific basis. But he is doing something else, too, that we may or may not get into much today. What he calls, because he's been in this field longer than me, the geopolitics. I mean, that's like a word I never would have uttered until a year or two, until, until COVID-19 COVID to try to figure out what's going on. Well, geopolitics? Um, I'm not smart enough, experienced enough to know anything about that. And what happened to me, folks, is when I started looking at COVID-19, all that I knew about, for example, the interlocking drug companies and all my expertise and in investigating them and their conniving with all the various institutions of the world, suddenly got writ large and got into this whole issue of globalism and this stunning word geopolitics. Well, I, I think that I'm going to dare take a leap and uh, have another session um, with Denis after this on geopolitics, but we may touch on it too today. Um, today, I want to get into his expertise as a, as a real scientist. Um, doing real, real work in this this field. And I was a little surprised to, to know, as so often happens, those of you who who uh, who know me well and have been watching this show, one of my, I hope, little vanities is that we find these wonderful people out in the world, and it turns out that many of them, now even outside of psychiatric reform, have known about my work. And this is just a lovely thing, because there's such a clampdown on people like me and on Dr. Rancourt as well um, in the media that I get the feeling nobody really knows about my work anymore. 
And to see that people are finding it. So it just touched my heart to find out out of the blue that uh, you were familiar with my work. So indulge me that that little bit of narcissism or support my ego needs. And tell me about when you've heard about me a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. I, I can't remember when, but it seems like several years now that I've known about your work, uh, <clears throat> your, what I would call your medical activism, but from an expert level, uh, being critical of these pharmaceutical drugs that uh, relate to uh, mental health. And uh, every one of your writings on this topic has has rung true to me and has helped me has helped confirm what I've always believed about these drugs. Uh, my background is one where I am well aware from reading the scientific literature that medicine is the third leading cause of death in in the Western world. And so your your uh, work fits exactly inside of that. And but I, I learned about your work before I got really interested in the causes of death and so on. So I I have to say I admire you and your work. I admire your your professional integrity uh, and the way that you stand up to these giants and the work that you've done. Well, thank you. You know, as I get older, I get more accepting of what I've done for. 60 or more years of my young adult and until now life. So thank you for that. Well, your work's amazing and your thinking is astonishing. Um, how about starting with, I didn't, I didn't warn you about this, but starting with getting, getting into COVID-19. I mean, for all of us, it was like, what are we doing here? What's going on? How did you get involved in COVID-19? Well, you know, um, I'm not just a physicist. I'm an interdisciplinary scientist. I have published in journals that deal with everything from planetary science to biogeochemistry to, to molecular chemistry <laughs> to material science to measurement theory in science, all the different measurement methods. And I've taught graduate level courses in all in, in the measurement sciences and uh, you know theoretical physics. I'm I'm the most interdisciplinary guy around. At least I was in my at my university, and um, so I've always had these broad interests. And I've spoke. I've changed fields many times in science. I've gone and I've in, pretty much every time I've changed fields in a major way. I ended up being uh, a plenary invited speaker at a conference in the new field. So I've, I've I've been able to learn quickly a lot of different areas, and um, um, so when I started seeing this craziness around COVID nineteen as it was coming up, one of the things that got my attention was this idea that you could use masks to prevent transmission of a viral respiratory disease, and just for, just from my knowledge of of what I knew at the time about transmission of these diseases and so on, it just didn't make much sense to me. So I decided to take a dive into the literature of what was known about this. And what I quickly discovered, very quickly, I read a lot of uh, papers quickly. And the way that I look for papers is I find good papers and I look at which papers are citing them and which of those papers are highly cited. So you quickly can fan through the literature and get a sense of the influential papers. I, I learned that there have been several policy grade uh, randomized controlled trials on whether a mask helps compared to no mask. And this is with verified outcome where you actually measure that the person was actually infected with the pathogen. Uh, you don't just rely on their anecdotes about their symptoms. So you look at those policy grade measurements, there have been now about 15 high quality ones that have been reviewed and looked at in detail, thousands and thousands of subjects. And they all say the same thing unambiguously. We cannot detect a benefit in terms of reducing transmission from from wearing a mask, whether it's an N95 mask, a surgical mask, or any other kind of mask, we cannot detect a benefit. That means that the effect is too small to be detected by these quality uh, uh, measurements. So I needed to, I said that clearly in an article, and I quoted from each of the papers uh, this conclusion that you can't tell. That article I published uh, quickly on ResearchGate on the 11th of April. And it people got very excited about it because it was this unambiguous statement that masks do not work. In fact, that was in the title. Uh, 
And so it, it quickly got 400,000 reads on ResearchGate, <laughs> uh, which had, I've never seen before. And uh, to the point where ResearchGate deplatformed this scientific article, which was a review of the high level scientific research. That's all it was. And uh, they deplatformed it. I wrote to the CEOs of the site and I said, "What the heck is going on? We can't we can't publish science on your science site anymore." And they explained that it had it was getting too many reads. They had to take it down because it was contradicting the World Health Organization and getting too many reads in doing so. And so, uh, for public safety, they decided to take it down. And that that's what research, but they haven't dared to take another one of my articles down because I just keep posting there. Um, uh, they might have gotten wind that I've, I'm not averse to suing uh, sites that deplatform me without a reason in terms of the contract, you know. I don't know what it was, but they haven't deplat. I think they only deplatform you, yeah, these, these kinds of sites, if you have too much of an influence. If you're being read too much, you, there's kind of like this threshold and then they take you out. So anyway. That's I, I believe that's I believe that's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so that's how I got into it. But as I, now that I was into it, I started thinking, well, why is everyone saying that this is a virulent pathogen? What is the well, before go, before going then? Let me just mine a little bit more your knowledge on the masks. Mm. Um, some of these studies that I'm familiar with um, actually were conducted in surgical rooms. Is that correct? Yes, in a, in a hospital environment. A in lot a of hospital them, and some of them in surgery, I believe. Uh, well, no, the, the surgical masks used in surgery are as another issue because the question there is not about transmission of a viral respiratory disease. It's more about uh, does it prevent the the people that the the person being operated on from developing an infection? After exactly. That. Yes. And, there are many uh, high quality uh, research results there that show that surgical masks play no positive role in that regard whatsoever, the, even just the surgical masks. So that is completely a myth. And there have yeah. been several articles on this and reviewing it and so on. In fact, one article uh, showed that there were more infections for when you wore a surgical mask in the operating room. So, um, but that's a separate question from viral respiratory diseases, yes. Well, not exactly. I mean, because the reason it's so important to me is, I mean, I, I'm a physician. I've scrubbed, you know, and put on the masks and gone in there and stuff. And... Um, a lot of many years ago, folks. Don't worry. Many many years ago, under under vast supervision and uh, doing nothing <laughs> important <laughs> as a student and an intern. But um, when I thought about that, masks don't work. That's the key. The masks work. Um, my first thought: Well, of course they must. They wouldn't be putting on these masks and you choke and you can't breathe well and you, you, somebody, you know, it's, it's just a mess, you know. Um, they have to work. And when I saw that, it was like taking away the, the goddess replica of masks or something, all of us surgeons, fantasy surgeons in the room. So I wanted to bring that up for people because I think that's going through folks' minds too. And the other thing about the masks that um, uh, I thought was so important is, and I'm sure you know more about this than I do. I think you probably did this literature better, much better than I did. <clears throat> and that is that they're not good for us. So I would love you also, while we're just mining the mask issue, and it's going to make this the best conversation on masks on the Internet, I think, just having you talk about these various parts of it. What about the fact they're bad for us and bad for children, bad for adults, bad for sick people? I suspect they're bad for surgeons. And what, what can you say about that? Yeah, there are, there are more and more studies coming out that, that where they actually look at the, the harms that directly come from masks. So there's a high quality study that looked at young, healthy males wearing masks and showed, uh, actually measured the physiology uh, the stresses on the on many systems in the body, um, the discomfort levels, uh, the and 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 these physiological responses suggest that if you did have a condition, a heart condition or whatever, 
it could kill you, and uh, or a condition that you don't know about, and so on. So there are more and more of these papers coming out. There's and there's there's um, a doctor in Toronto, I believe, who with his group uh, reviewed all the literature on the harms that could come from bacteria. You see, regular cloth masks are not hydrophobic, whereas surgical masks are. So regular cloth masks that you encourage the general population to wear are also capture humidity and are a very good medium for the growth of bacteria. And mm -hmm. so you're, you're basically putting a bacterial medium near your face and nose and keeping it there the whole time. And so it's warm, it's humid, and you've got, and there are a lot of bacteria even in your mouth and the buccal area and so on that can infect your deep lungs. They just normally don't. But he was suggesting mm -hmm. that if you if you're forced to breathe them over and over again, that you could you that it could cause that kind of infection. So they reviewed uh, the the all the uh, medical conditions that can arise from the, just the regular bacteria that you normally have once they get into the wrong places, and so there's all kinds of potential dangers like that that are being explored more and more now. Oh, yeah. Uh, in in the quality randomized control trials that I read, the one negative feature that they noted, which was very clear, is that nurses and medical personnel developed far more headaches when they wore masks than if they weren't wearing masks. And this was a very significant result. In fact, the result was more significant than anything else. That was one thing that came out unambiguously from the data, is that uh, the workers were getting headaches. Um, so that that th there's a lot of potential yeah. dangers, and they've I mean, been known yeah. for a long time. You have to be, I mean, you have to be depleting your oxygen, mm -hmm. and you have to be uh, increasing your CO2, and that that could cause headaches and a lot worse, dizziness yes. and, and illnesses. And the detailed article that I read pointed out that some of your your your, your functions compensate for that. So you don't necessarily get a decrease in, let's say, blood level of something, but your your heart is working harder and this kind of thing. So yeah, they, they the actually look at the, the, the detailed physiology of this. Um, and and so that kind of work is just starting to be published in the in the journals now. You see, Peter, what's wrong here is that when a government applies a policy like this and they don't know what they're doing and it's never been done before, the precautionary principle means that they need to prove that these likely harms are not present before they do it. That's what the precautionary principle is. In this case, they've reversed it. They go ahead and do things, and then they expect scientists to demonstrate that it was okay to do these things. They, they've really reversed it. It's, it's a mad world out there. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's not normal that these studies are just coming out now. And of course, they're not funded. If you want to do a study on the benefits of vaccines, they'll throw money at you. If you want to do a study on the possible harms of masks and actually measuring the physiology and everything, you're going to have a hard time. And it's not a career advancement move, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. This is so important, folks. This is so real. And then getting published is a problem. And That's right. Yeah. So so that's the now on the masks, there's something else that came out in my in my research. And, and this is from my perspective as a physicist. Also, the one thing we need to know about these viral respiratory diseases is that they are seasonal. They shoot up in the winter and they come down in the summer. And that cycle, if you look at all cause mortality as a function of, of time, like per week or per month, it's very clear and it's an incredibly regular pattern. Since the since we've have good data since the Second World War, you can see this, and there's it, there's nothing you're going to do to stop it. No vaccination program has had it put a dent in this. Not, nothing you can do to stop this, right? And so, why is it seasonal? Well, the re scientists have figured this out. Uh, I was I was surprised and pleased to learn that the um, the aerosol particles that transmit the virus are stable in air when you have low absolute humidity, the winter time. So in winter, tr the, the transmissivity fires up by a factor of five or more. So these things that are in our bodies all the time, all of a sudden they can be transmitted easily in the winter, but not in the summer.
Now, these viral respiratory diseases are not a thing near the equator. They only exist and are a problem for populations in mid-latitude countries. Wow. So in, in, in the winter time, you know, Europe, North America, and so on. And in the reverse latitude, in the winter, in the winter of the southern hemisphere, it's, it's our summer. That's when they get these cycles, okay? And it's mm -hmm. because of absolute humidity. So once you, and this is, this is more than proven. There have been massive studies that have demonstrated this and the mechanism related to humidity and so on. So once you understand this, you know that all these cyclical uh, diseases are, are seasonal because of transmissivity, because of the quality of the air. And once you know that, you also know that they're transmitted by aerosol particles. And it's because they're transmitted by aerosol particles that masks do not work. Because aerosol particles are very fine and they're part of the fluid air. So any, any low impedance route around the mask or through the biggest pores in the mask and so on, you will breathe those particles in. So it's impossible to have a mask always well fitted, almost glued to your skin and never adjust it and never have wrinkles and never have low impedance routes that would not let you breathe in these aerosol particles if they're in the room where you're working. That's the point. So masks, for that reason, you, you can, you can, now you can uh, infer that that's why they don't work. It's because of the transmission route. That, that's the conclusion that I came to. That is, that is fascinating. Now, if we look at the, um, you know, these hot spots, you know, in churches where people are singing or mm -hmm. uh, maybe even in uh, Trump's garden, uh, the White House, when he was giving that presentation, his amazing wife was there. Um, would, it, does, would it help in momentarily to be wearing some sort of a mask or a better mask in these close group? There's no... Cold? In a no. chorus. I don't know. I had wear it in chorus. There, there's no evidence that in any circumstances that have been studied, including the general population, recently there was a large Danish study that looked at masks in the general population. There is, there is no known circumstance where masks have had any benefit in terms of reducing the risk of transmission. None. Okay. So, the but, but. There are things that are known that could be done. They're just not done. In fact, they're, they're hiding them from us. Uh, once you understand that it's about aerosol particles, and I can tell you that, that there's a, an article that just came out that, that basically proves, does a, a global review and basically proves that contact transmission is not a thing. It's not about washing your hands and cleaning surfaces. That has no impact. It's all about air transmission, okay? God. That's now demonstrated, and that's in my latest article. I, I review that work. Now, um, where was I going with this? So, so where was I going with that? So contact is not a thing. Yes. Well, you're saying they're keeping from us the things that matter. Right. That's it. So once you know it's about air transmission, what can you do in, a, in the built environment? You ventilate. You take out those aerosols. And this has been known for more than a decade. There was a large review that was written in 2007, which did a review of all the studies that were relevant and, sh and showed that if you want to prevent epidemics in care homes and hospitals and places like that, and, and, and you ventilate, that's what you have to do. And then following that study in 2009, the World Health Organization themselves published a huge expert panel report in which they said, now you must all ventilate, and at least this many liters per second in this kind of environment, and so on. They had tables, great big report. Guess what? You can't find that report. It's buried. They put it in water quality toxicity section in their website. You can't find the report that says the most important public health thing you can do regarding epidemics in care homes is to ventilate. The, it, and this is who, who, sh who shoved it aside? Well, they put it on their website someplace yeah. where no one would ever yeah. find it. Yeah. So, we could say a lot about who folks, the World Health Organization, it's, it's a, a collaborator in making us all sick. It's quite bizarre. Um, yes. I mean, and that's not, not even an exaggeration any, anymore. A, a recent thing, just to throw in a little bit off of this particular subject, but 
take a breath. There's so much wonderful data you're giving. By the way, folks, you're listening to the most intelligent, informed discussion uh, by this man, this wonderful man, uh, on, on this subject that you'll ever hear. Certainly, and I've heard nothing close to it. Um, but uh, the there's a, a, a very good article that's um, that's just come out. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to hold off because I'm not re I'm not remembering the name, and I want to give credit to to him, but I'll just say briefly that the World Health Organization has literally taken the whole idea of herd immunity off its website. Yes, yes, you heard about that. Yes, I know. And about yeah. uh, it, it was uh, from a uh, the American Institute A E I R. That's uh, right. And um, a wonderful man. He's been on my show, and I'm blacking on his name. Do you remember? I don't remember the name. Ah, this is but terrible. I saw the article. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll. Um, uh, so, so you that, can go. That, you that, can go that, to their to go to their website and look for. Yes. It's a a e i r to their mm -hmm. website. He's the editor. He's a marvelous guy. You've seen him on this show. This may be telling you who he is by now, and. Um, uh, he, uh, his name will come to me as we're talking, but it's it's all about who literally, and he tracks it, eliminating yes. herd immunity. So you have to have vaccines. It's, yes, it's folks. It is it is so evil out there, and this is this is not the subject for today because it's <clears throat> so large. But it's a teaser. Maybe that's why I brought it up mm -hmm. because I want to have uh, at the next opening toward the end of January. I want to or early February, have you on the air talking with me about globalism? What, in, what is on out there? Yeah. Um, I probably this, interrupted Peter, you. Peter, this notion that natural immunity doesn't exist, that we shouldn't even be talking about it. It's crazy. It's so, it's so insane. If there was not uh, uh, natural immunity, the species, our human species would not exist. There have been hundreds of these uh, viral respiratory disease viruses co-evolving and living in our bodies forever. And uh, there is, and, and the whole idea of a virus is that it reproduces by killing your cells, by using the material of your cells. Yeah. If we did not have natural immunity, we'd all be dead. There is no question about it. Yeah. So, so it's just this insane situation. Of course there's natural immunity. How do we survive every winter? How do we, you know, how how do we do this? Uh, yeah, it the level of insanity is extreme. It's it's really crazy. I have to say. Yeah. Um, um, have we, we well we've covered we've covered pretty well now masks. Um, yeah. And uh, you're you're saying flat out they're not helping us. Don't don't wear them. Absolutely. There's there's no use to these masks, none whatsoever. It's not unless, unless you want to get sicker. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, it's it's just it's a it's a it's the belief like a cult belief. Uh, it, it is contrary to science. If there was any kind of a benefit, it would have been detected in these many uh, quality trials, and no yeah. no beneficial effect can be detected. Um, so now there has to come you, a point where the science has to be useful for something. This is please, exactly please, what this kind yeah. of science is intended to do. It's to guide policy. If you do randomized control trials and you don't find an effect and you can't detect the effect, it means yeah. the effect is so small that it's smaller than every other variable in your that you controlled for. You know, in in your experiment, it's just crazy that yeah. we would be pushing masks given the state of science right now. And uh, then this, the same thing basically for hand washing. I mean, I wash my hands uh, like I'm supposed to, supposedly, and I'm, I think my, uh, my image in my mind is maybe enteroviruses or something that's clinging to my hands. I mean, but not respiratory viruses. That's what you're saying? Yeah, it, it, it does not transmit by contact, period. Uh, the, these diseases do not transmit that way. Um, the science has been reviewed extensively just recently. I reviewed that in my paper. That's all there is to it. Forget about compulsively washing your hands and cleaning surfaces. Um, 
And there are lots of negative impacts of that. I mean, in Canada, they've had to recall more than 50 brands of these hand sanitizers that were toxic. Uh, you know, uh, mm. there's all kinds of, of negative impacts. But, um, you know, the most important thing, I, I want to move on to something else now, because I, I then said, well, okay, how virulent is this thing? Can we get some hard data to inform us about virulence of this latest uh, viral respiratory disease of this season. So what you find quickly when you look at epidemiological papers is that you can't trust the, the cause of death that they're assigning because you're right. looking at vulnerable people who have comorbidity conditions and you just it, it becomes a political process to assign cause of death. So the way that scientists get around this is they look at all cause mortality. And they look at high resolution all cause mortality as a function of time, even by day, even by day. Uh, in France, you can have it by region, by sub region, and by day. You have this really high quality data. And uh, we, I've been studying that data. So, okay, so I've written two papers now that demonstrate that there was a huge spike, a huge surge of all cause mortality death that was synchronous around the world where it occurred always exactly just a few days after the pandemic was announced. So what happened after the pandemic was announced, the World Health Organization said, you must prepare your hospitals, you're going to get a surge of patients, make sure you've got the beds to handle them. So yeah. what did many jurisdictions like New York do? They sent their sick and elderly people that were in hospital beds into care facilities and locked them in. The opposite. Awesome. Yeah, we've written about that. That's just awful. It well, that is likely the mechanism that caused this surge everywhere around the world. Now, what's important about this surge? It has three properties that tell you that it, this was not a natural phenomenon. One is the timing is related to the pandemic announcement. Secondly, it is dramatically different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There's more than 30 states in the U.S. that didn't have any signal whatsoever, okay? So mm -hmm. it depends what was done rather than whether the pathogen was there. Now, yeah. that, that granularity of the process is really important because in these viral respiratory diseases, they're always the same state to state, country to country, region to region. You always get pretty much the same pattern. There's never big variation like this in the all-cause mortality per time uh, data, okay? So this is a first. And what that immediately tells you is that it's not about the infection, which spreads very quickly. It's about what you did, how you responded to the infection. And the third feature about this uh, surge in all-cause mortality is that it happened later in the season of viral respiratory diseases in the northern latitudes than has ever been seen a peak like this occurring, ever. You look at all the best data you can, the only time there's been a peak outside of the usual position for a peak, which typically uh, peaks in January, let's say, is when, for example, in the summer in France, there was a heat wave that killed 10,000 elderly people. It gave a peak in the summer. This is the first time that a viral respiratory disease supposedly caused a peak this late in the, in the season. OK, after the pandemic was announced. So you've got these three properties that tell you that something very strange is going on. And repeat the three properties. So the three properties are it is synchronous with an announcement of a pandemic that precedes all of these sudden peaks. Hmm. OK, it is granular in the sense that it's dramatically different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, depending on what you did. And the third one is it's later in the uh, transmissivity cycle than has ever been seen for a viral respiratory disease since so 1945. Let, yeah. So let, let's look at what exactly is happening in these places. And <clears throat> uh, in one case, we know then it's actually is real. We're getting coronavirus spike in New York state from our tyrannical governor, uh, Tucker, I was going to say, I'm, I wish I could remember my friend's name rather than Cuomo, but Tucker is the <laughs> the person at Ayers who wrote this amazing, amazing uh, article um, 
and if you don't, if you're not familiar with this organization, and uh, you know, go and look it up, folks, and and also look for my interview with him uh, during the coronavirus period. So one of the things we're seeing is that there is a real spike going on, but it's human made by taking a lot of people with coronavirus, maybe some without, and shoving them together in these nursing homes. Well, there, there's no there's no convincing evidence that these deaths that we're attributing to corona were due to coronavirus. Okay, so good. So, I'm so glad. About, so we'll set that yeah. aside for a minute, but we are causing a peak of disorders. Yeah. That's yes. the key. Not even yeah. necessarily coronavirus at all, but That's a right. peak of disorders. And this is, yeah. folks, 100 percent consistent with everything my scientific mind has tried to wrap itself around and which I rebel against because it's so horrific, every bit of this. It's so good to have such a wise and thoughtful Well, the other, the other thing I did— <laughs> as, you, as you are doing all this— yeah. Well, the other thing I did was to uh, report on the science that has been extraordinarily critical, viciously critical, in a sense, as far as science writers can be, of the, the PCR scam. Uh, the, the original yeah. article that proposed what the test would be to detect uh, COVID-19 by PCR has been um, shown to be invalid, clearly yeah. shown to be invalid. So uh, you, I could explain to you how it is that this PCR test is is invalid for the application that it was intended. Okay, that's yeah. one thing I could do. So that means that none of the tests that are being used in the propaganda, the test results, uh, mean what they say they mean whatsoever. See, the thing is, they the the test was designed to hopefully pick up a small genetic sequence that they hope is characteristic of this COVID-19 virus. But that little sequence, which is amplified to see if you're going to get a positive, it can be on a piece of DNA that's already been destroyed by someone's immune system, for example, okay? So there's no, mm -hmm. the test is unable to detect whether what you're finding a positive to is a viable, is a viable virus that can cause infection. I've never heard it so put so well. That's right. So the test does not tell you if the person being tested is carrying a virus that can infect someone else mm -hmm. or if it's just a piece of something. OK, mm -hmm. so that's very important because when you look at the PCR, uh, the, 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 the studies that, that, that looked at P the PCR technique, there's two important parameters. One is the number of cycles, amplification cycles, so-called CT. And the other is the time between when the person was uh, infected or exposed, the, the onset of symptoms, the time moving forward. So the first thing is, if you're more than 10 days beyond that time of being exposed, all the PCR results are for dead viruses. They're meaningless. So all those tests. And now you got to remember, if you line up thousands of people to get a PCR test, the great majority of them will have been exposed or infected beyond 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. So all of those tests are negatives in the usual sense. Wow. Okay. Well explained That's again. That's one thing. The other thing is, now if you look at within the 10 days, approximately half of those automatically, when you do the measurement of trying to see if a virus can be uh, cultured in, on cells that are des optimally designed to culture this virus, about half of them do not, are not viable viruses uh, within the 10 days, mm -hmm. okay? And the other thing is, irrespective of the time, if you're amplifying more than 30 cycles, it's pretty much garbage. What you're getting is unreliable. Yeah, and they go to 40, 45, don't they? They go to 40. That's right. So that is hard science looking at this particular test that was that mm -hmm. was uh, proposed early on by at least four of the co-authors had severe conflict of interest problems there when they when they put that out. So that that is now well established. There are many groups have verified this and have commented on it and so on. Yeah. So the PCR test should never have been introduced and should never have been used for mass testing of the population. It is, it is just 
uh, technology being used to make propaganda. That's all it is. Was this, uh, was this test, and I know nothing about this, used also with AIDS and highly discredited, or am I, I, is that a fragment? I, I, I didn't study that, but my understanding is that uh, PCR technology was proposed as a way uh, uh, of uh, identifying AIDS. I mean, you've been doing an amazing job debunking and debunking and debunking. I know. Do you think there's a virus at all? Because people are going to say you're a virus denier, or I'm a virus denier. Or, uh, tell me about that. My position is that um, it doesn't matter whether there's a novel strain of a novel virus. Uh, any virus could have done could have served this purpose of propaganda and of a pretext to do what they're doing. It could have been any any one of the hundreds of viruses that inhabit, inhabit us. They're always mutating. There's always a, a spectrum of viruses that are active and are transmitting in the wintertime. Um, so I, I, I wrote an editorial where I said, it could be anything. You, you, you could do this with anything. If you look at the, the, the elderly people that were transferred from hospitals and into homes, they were certainly infected with all kinds of things, bacterial infections, any slew of viruses. You see, when scientists take an infected person and analyze the viruses they can detect within them that are reproducing and that are in large quantity, they typically find two, three, four, five different viruses that they can identify, the ones that we know, are reproducing and active in that person. Okay, so I think it's it's to go down in the wrong direction. We shouldn't follow virologists because virologists have a very uh, narrow view of the world. They think in terms of one novel strain that that all of a sudden pops up and is uh, virulent because we don't have immunity to it anymore, and that's the thing that we're that we're yes. going to call everything everything we see in this winter. Uh, death cycle, we're going to call due to that thing, you know, and decide whether it's a pandemic or just an epidemic. That is a, I think that's an incorrect view of what's actually going on. Uh, well, let me oh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I think yeah, what's actually yeah. going on is that every winter in the mid latitude countries, you dial up transmissivity of all viral respiratory diseases. And whatever has mutated, whatever's present that can newly infect people that don't have enough immunity or immunity to something similar enough, they'll be infected. And it spreads like that. Um, that, you know, when, when people said, Denis, do you think there'll be a second wave? My answer was, I think there'll, there will be a 1,000th wave. This will not be the <laughs> second wave. Every winter you get a wave, uh, you know. Um, so, so my position is, um, a, a lot of the phenomenon, the social and medical phenomenon, would have arisen irrespective of what the virologists call it, or want to call it, mm -hmm. or to call it. So, so to me, it's kind of a not such an important question. That's that's kind of my take on it. Let me tell you the importance that many of the physicians that I'm working with, uh, and it's interesting, folks. We we come. Um, uh, Denia and I come from two different circles. I come from a medical circle and uh, with uh, huge numbers of people involved in it now working on these issues. And you're coming from uh, maybe a more pure science circle. What is the, the people who are giving you more information and discussion? Well I'm involved in an international group of scientists called PANDA, and they're from all fields. But there's there's epidemiologists, uh, clinical yeah. people, MDs, and so on. They're they're from all fields, and so I'm getting a kind of a cross pollinization from quite a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I get some of that, not not the extent you do, but I get a very intense interaction with physicians and epidemiologists. Usually, they're both. Uh, often, they're both. And there's no doubt among them as if I can call them a them, that there is a particularly nasty bug identified with, not, not lethal, but a particularly nasty bug. I'm working with many uh, physicians, um, talking to them on the Internet, having them on the show. We've had some very important treating physicians on the show. And they are identifying a very specific 
and at times very difficult to treat if you don't know what you're doing virus. Mm -hmm. So I want to tell briefly about that and to uh, get your feedback on it because it's a very, very important issue, obviously. COVID-19, according to the, the doctors, has, a, and I don't treat patients physically, so I haven't seen this, has a couple of characteristics. One of them is, if not treated properly, it results in horrendous, potentially horrendous blood clotting. So initially, the Italians were describing they would with, try to, you know, withdraw blood from the person and it would clot as it got withdrawn. And that this is rare, folks, uh, but to some degree can occur in the, uh, relative amounts. So you might get a little clotting or you might get serious clotting that affects the heart and the lungs. Um, that was one, one of the uh, qualities of it. And um, the other is the, this incredible uh, cytokine uh, attack. Um, and um, it involves a, a massive, in a sense, overreaction of the body uh, to, to its own processes. So the person gets sicker. And that needs to be treated with steroids and, uh, and uh, of various kinds. And another characteristic of this is that they've got a cocktail that they've created and discovered and worked on for it. That includes hydroxychloroquine and, and perhaps a, a new drug as well that's a little bit more controversial. And it includes a certain a sort of uh, helpful additional antibiotics, um, particularly good old z pack is, is one of them, zithromycin, and vitamin D and vitamin C. Um, and that with this, they have a great success and that they are treating patients who do turn out positive, whatever that's worth, along with the disease process at home before they get sick and having a, a great deal of success with it. And I recently uh, had a personal experience with this. A family member uh, called and um, said that uh, uh, she and her boyfriend had tested positive and they were both coming down with symptoms that were consistent with COVID um, and feeling ill. And I got them in touch with uh, the uh, information that's available on the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. I discussed this in a um, number of places and uh, including with uh, um, hour-long interviews with Dr. Valit, V-L-I-E-T, and Dr. McCullough. <clears throat> and they got in touch with that network, which you can make contact with. It's important to talk about it anyway, that mm -hmm. you can make contact with through uh, um, the association, the, the AAPS, and they have a blue book, and that blue book catches people up with the treatment and prevention of this, and it uh, puts them in touch with physicians. And... Um, my uh, family member and her boyfriend immediately did this. They got overnight uh, hydroxychloroquine. And very much as I've been told before, they felt better after the first dose. And within two, three days, they were very, very much better, which is, you know, unusual when two people are coming down with an infectious disease to respond so quickly. So, and um, like you and I, these people believe that the death rates are vastly overinflated, but that it's a serious problem and that when not treated properly, which the government has tried very hard to make sure we can't do, uh, we do have a more serious illness. What What is your notion about where that fits into your experience, well, which you're hearing from the scientists? I would respond from my reading that influenza itself is a serious disease. Influenza causes uh, horrific epidemics within care homes. This is documented in the scientific literature. 80% uh, of people, in, persons in a care home can be killed by influenza. 
uh, influenza being present, but there's usually also... Uh, let, let me interrupt there, because I think that's an obvious issue. But their response, for example, uh, Mer uh, Meryl Nass, N-A-S-S, who folks has been on this show and will be on again, has in our group uh, recently said that, yes, that's true. But in her 40 years, I think she said, of hospital work, and often involved in epidemiological kinds of issues and, and uh, infections. She's been in different countries where there have been uh, epidemics, that she has never seen this blood clotting phenomena, and she's never seen the cytokine storm. That's right. a word I stumbled over earlier. And she believes very much so that this is a a mean clinical entity for older people. Yeah. And the data on older people, I think, is probably excessive compared to the flu. I mean, oh, well, here's another factor. The, the flu attacks younger folks. It's a serious problem for younger folks. This disorder, when they identify it, is not. So I'll give you a chance to respond. And um, and this extreme death rate up of the older people is uh, more extreme. It's still not out the ceiling, folks. Um, but it's it's so remarkable how it spares 30, 40-year-olds, 20-year-olds, and children entirely, pretty much. So that that's another phenomena that that surrounds this disorder as as they're looking looking at it. Um, there was one other thought I had I wanted to uh, to bring up, but that's that's enough for now. That there is really a disorder, a disease entity going around. Well, I can only respond how I respond uh, based on my readings and my sure. thinking about this. Um, I think we have to distinguish hard objective statistics and their circumstances from. Uh, clinical observations as reported by many clinicians. Um, clinical observations are high. Well, wait, wait, some of this is epidemiological data. The flu yeah. does not spare children the belief when they have identified the no, syndrome of COVID-19. The flu does not kill them. Makes children. them very, very sick. Yeah, but Makes, it doesn't kill them. But it's... Uh -huh. In terms of... Well, it certainly uh, kills people yeah. on up before you get to being old with these... Uh, you don't think so? I mean, this is interesting. No, the flu, generally, the, the flu is responsible for deaths in care homes of elderly people. That's what it mainly does. And the same is true of COVID-19. Um, when you start getting into details of... Uh, you see, I, I have a problem because... When you have this kind of a media frenzy and this kind of, uh, you, everyone's wearing their COVID glasses, okay? And how often have teams of medical experts looked at the blood and the, uh, and, and the symptoms of people with regular influenza with this amount of detail? And, and, and noting all the different peculiarities that can occur because a lot of different complications occur with just regular influenza, a whole slew of them. There's comorbidities, there's all kinds of things happening. Uh, so, uh, and this has been studied in the literature a lot. I've, 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 read, I've read a lot of that stuff. So I am concerned that uh, clinicians might not be, you know, they, they could be wearing COVID-19 glasses. Uh, and I think if we, if we look at just deaths, death rate. There is nothing unusual about this. If you integrate that winter burden death, including the late COVID peak that I talked about, in all-cause mortality, no chance of making a mistake, misassigning deaths. The, the total deaths for 2020 are the same as they've ever been for the last 20 years, the winter deaths, okay, the excess. So nothing in terms of virulence has happened. The only exception is the USA. The USA has some strange things going on. Um, a lot of summer... Uh, We're going to have to finish um, okay. in a minute. So take just yeah. another minute and we'll have to finish. Now, uh, just to say, we, we, need, we would need more time to get into this. But yeah, we, I think so. We well, can pick it up on our next time. Sure, too. sure. 
Yeah. But to finish up with your thought on that, I just want to thank you for well, being here. I want to say that uh, we're obviously disagreeing, and I don't need to put a, a fine point on that. But what I want to do as a result of your challenge is to look more at what kind of clinical literature do we have that really helps us distinguish these two diseases. The clinicians are certainly distinguishing them in their experience. Well, you see, but Peter, one um, of the problems is you have not recently taken this careful and detailed look at influenza. We haven't. We haven't got that. There was yeah, no but there is going to be. No a, there's to. going to be a deep look at H1N1 the, and the various flu epidemics. Now, there's going to be stuff there where yes, doctors and, looked and, intensely and, no, at but Peter, look at look, talking about these previous pandemics, you've got an article that I cited in my recent paper that shows that they were all propaganda pandemics. In, in yes, a, we know a, that. We know that. But we're still, the question is, was there an entity? That's right. Different. We're going to have to stop at this point because we're running out of wonderful time. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Denis Rancourt. I really always want to call you Dr. Rancourt. You come across with such a good solemnity and seriousness. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being on the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour. Um, I'm going to challenge some of the folks I know, and I want to get them to respond. And it might also be interesting if we could even have a discussion. Maybe we can do that. But in the meanwhile, folks, accept differences of opinion among scientists. I mean, and if the scientists are coming from really distinctly different backgrounds, look at that and weigh it and think about it, because it's all part of it. Science is people. That's the damn problem with science. That's its Achilles heel. It's us. It's people. There's no way around it. But Peter, the, in the end, you have to believe the physicists. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> I always suspected the physicists were smarter than me, but... I don't know. I, I don't go on the smarts. I go on the, the wisdom and the persistence part of it. Of course. We doctors, we have wisdom and persistence. My friend, my new friend, thank you so much. You're most welcome. It's a great pleasure. A great pleasure. Yeah.